Magarin Flack here with a still life painting demo. It's mostly a time lapse and it's a pretty long one. In fact, this took me about four hours to paint in total. The surface that I'm painting on is Alumalite, and I just put some raw umber and mineral spirits on there to kind of thin it down, paint it in there. So I had some type of toned background. Now, the first thing that I like to do is put in a gesture drawing. That's what I'm calling this as a gesture drawing with green. I'm using the complementary color to the red that I am going to place down on the canvas. And the gesture drawing is just there to help me see where I'm going to be placing all of the objects compositionally in the painting. Then I go in and I start to paint in the red, slightly red tones, and also the general tones values of or the grape cluster I should call it. Then I step into painting the green on those pluots. Yes, those are pluots. They're not plums, they're plum apricot hybrid. And um, these ones are the flavor supreme pluots. They're just phenomenal. I highly recommend eating them. I have the flavor supreme fruit tree in my orchard right now, but that's where I got these two pluots from. And then here is the twig that I'm starting to paint in here. I'm not so concerned about getting all of the little details. I'm just trying to get a general likeness of the still life that I've set up off to the side. I, I'm not going to show you the still life. Um, I don't think it's really necessary to show you the still life because the composition is the most important thing and I'm trying to experiment with this composition currently. So what you're seeing is not a totally finished painting. By the end of the video, you'll see a totally finished painting. But I think that it's important to talk about a few things when it comes to painting. Um, a lot of students that I get, they sit there and look at their painting and they don't know how to start. And the best way, I think, in starting a painting is to just do it. Kind of like Nike, you just kind of, you do it. You just start, you throw some paint, on the canvas and you learn to deal with it. If you don't start painting, then it takes a while for you to kind of grasp what you're going to do mentally. Kind of like, um, I think a lot of students tend to, when they're starting out, uh, try to figure out how on earth they're gonna play a whole game of chess with their paints before they even put any paint down on the canvas. But you have to make a move. You just have to make a move. You have to just put something down and then make a decision on what the next move is going to be. In time, when you have gotten a lot of experience with painting, then you can start to play like chess where you're thinking hours down the line and you're like, okay, I want this result and you'll know how to get it because you've painted so much instead of Currently, it, it's like, well, how do I get it to look like this John Singer Sargent painting? Well, you'll have to put in a lot of time to be able to make it look like John Singer Sargent. Kind of, uh, that's what he did. When I'm working on my paintings, that's my biggest advice is just get paint on the canvas and deal with it and learn to deal with it. So here, this is the first layer. Um, the surface that's alumalite is very slick. So I have to put the paint on the canvas effectively and try not to mix it too much on the canvas because it will just come off. I, I can paint it off. So I'm using also a soft haired brush, something that is a, I think it, this one is specifically a synthetic brush that um, is not a bristle, but more, more kind of like a mix between a sable and a mongoose. So it can hold some paint, it doesn't hold a lot, but it holds more than a sable. And that allows me to put some paint on the canvas so I can deal with it. And I'm not so concerned about getting everything exactly nailed in this first layer. In fact, I'm just trying to build up some texture and nail in some of those colors that I'm seeing quickly. Because the second layer that I put down there is going to be more important than the first layer. This painting is done indirectly, meaning I do one layer, let it dry, and then do another layer and let it dry and do a third layer and let it dry. I think this painting, I did it in uh, three different sessions, taking a total of maybe five hours to do the whole 
painting, but I like to break it up. I like to do indirect painting because of the textures that you can get with indirect painting. Uh, direct painting is nice too. I can do direct painting. I just don't like the end result. I make, I, I like to make them look like paintings, which is good. I don't like to render them to death, which I also think is good, but I like to have variety of mark making, variety of color. I like to have broken color and broken shapes. And I'll, I'll show you an example of what broken color could look like. It doesn't mean it actually looks like this, but it could look like this um, when I get to that point of doing my second layer. But here on the first layer, just working on those Pluot paintings, um, the Pluots, and I'm trying to figure out what color of green it is. Is it a yellow green or a blue green? In some parts, it's more of a yellow green. In other parts, it's more of a blue green. And it tends to be more of a neutral green in the uh, Terminator, where you're, where I'm starting to turn the form on the Pluot. So I'm just trying to get some variation in there. It's not a solid green Pluot. It has some variation in it, which makes it really beautiful. And yes, it is that red on the inside. I mean, it's if you have never tasted a Pluot before, I highly recommend going out and getting some and eating them because they're really good. And they stay on the tree for a very long time. Sorry, that, I digress. So rendering out the forms of the greens, trying to figure out what color of green is in there. I saw the parts would get a little bit more red, which if you mix green and red together, will make it a little bit more gray. There were also other areas that had more yellow and more blue in the lights. And I needed to express those subtle color changes but I'm trying to keep the values compressed and close together so that I can turn the form effectively and describe the variation of the color. So here I'm throwing in a highlight and the highlight is, the specular highlight is not the finished specular highlight that you'll see at the very end, but it just kind of helps me gauge where the values in this Pluot and how light is the highlight in relationship to the rest of it. And I put it down so that I can deal with it. If I don't put the highlight down, then I don't know if it's too light or too dark. And it makes, makes it harder for me to be able to mix the right highlight value. So now I'm going in and putting in some of those cast shadows from the various fruit and also the tree. Cast shadows are a very interesting thing. Uh, depending upon your light source, my light source is natural light. It's to the right. It's kind of behind me when I'm looking at the still life. And that means that the color of northern light or natural light is blue. It, it's very blue. It's not direct sun. And because it's blue, um, the light side of all the shapes are going to be cooler in tone and the shadow shapes that are closer to the objects are going to be warmer in tone. But here you can see that I put um, underneath that branch a cast shadow that is more blue towards the grapes and less blue or more orange towards the branch where it touches the surface. That's because there's less light getting to that branch where it's hitting the surface. And so that makes it warmer. So I'm, I'm making those transitions between warm and cool in the lights now, and I made them slightly in the shadows. So here I'm just taking these light shapes and I'm, I'm painting it around it. Now, the thing that is interesting about still lifes, at least from my observation, is if you are painting a still life object on a surface, it doesn't matter the color of the surface the light is going to be bouncing off of that object or the still life onto the surface. So here it's mostly on a white type surface and I am taking a, like a palette knife, I'm taking a paintbrush. If I want details, I will take a paintbrush uh, to soften out edges between the foreground and the background. If I'm just trying to lay in paint, I'll use a palette knife to be able to lay in that paint. But the light shapes, need to really be defined or described by having 
light or the color of the object bouncing onto the surface. You're also going to have uh, the color of the surface bouncing into the still life. So depending upon what surfaces you put them on, you are going to be changing the colors of those surfaces. So here I'm painting the grapes and grape clusters I think are freaking awesome because it forces me to keep the shapes very abstract for a very long period of time. I am not going to paint every single little grape. I'm going to express that it is a cluster. The cluster of grapes is more important than the individual grape. So I'm, I'm painting in the darker values now. I saw that there were some green grapes there. There were some more red, some more violet grapes, some more blue grapes. And there is this little um, protective coat coating that goes over most grapes and they don't really look glossy it's kind of like a a matte it almost looks like dirt that's kind of tossed onto the surface of the grapes and they're not looking very glossy unless you go in and you wipe them all down then they look very glossy and they don't have this bluish tone to them so in the light side of these grapes they are more blue than the actual color of the grape on the inside. Whereas the inside of the grape is going to be more red, especially in this variety. This variety has more of that reddish tone inside of it. So I'm playing with blues and reds in painting the grapes because I need to describe the local color of the grape and also the light bouncing off the surface of the grape with that protective coating on it. Um, I'm not going to paint in the highlights of these grape clusters. I'm just looking at the division between lights and shadows. The light shapes are in two different areas, the far right larger cluster and then the middle right of the cluster. And the other nice thing about painting grapes is you don't have to paint every single one of them. You just have to indicate that there's information on there that it is a grape. And I get a lot of students asking questions on, well, if I'm painting this house, should I paint every single brick? And I'm like, yeah, go for it. You want to paint every single brick? That sounds exciting. For me, that doesn't sound very exciting. But um, if they want to go for it, I'm totally open for them to give it a go. What I would recommend doing instead is implying that there are bricks on the surface, not just painting every single brick that would take a long time, and will it make the painting better? Uh, I, I don't think it will, but, you know, if you're the artist and you're the one that's doing the painting, then and you're like, oh, no, I need to paint every single brick, then paint every single brick. For me, no, I, I want to have some sense of mystery in my paintings. I know that sound, might sound like a cop-out, but I like to have variation. That variation creates interest. So I need to have variation in rendering. I need to have variation in color. I need to have variation in mark making, in values, in hues, in tone. I need to have a lot of variation in my painting so that it increase the interest of the painting and people want to approach it and look at the painting itself. Not just the image of the painting, but how is it painted? How do you effectively make something look like a cluster of grapes and uh, make it interesting enough that people want to go up and look at it? So that's why I like Impressionism for that reason. Um, I don't like photorealism because, well, I, I don't know, and this is so debatable, so debatable. You have skills if you're a photorealist. You better believe you've got skills. But that's all you're really showing is your skills, which is fine. But think about the skill of editing. How do you make it so that it is interesting to look at and not everything is rendered? How do you, not force, but how do you uh, guide the eye person that's looking at your artwork? How do you guide their eye around the composition to look at everything that you have painted? Well, that's a debatable topic, but... 
Um, here I've gotten to the point of where now I'm painting on the second day. So I did that my first layer and now I'm coming back in and I'm putting in some texture. Now I'm, what I'm doing with my paintbrush is I'm holding it at a steep angle um, or more parallel to the canvas so that I'm dragging the paint across and it the texture of the first layer will hold on to the paint in some areas and not express it in other areas. This goes back to the interest of variation. And I do it at these angles. Um, I'm also looking at where it's changing from a cool value to a warm value. I'm trying to express the difference of those warm and cool values within, well, it ultimately every object. But I already have the value mostly established. Now I just need to turn the form by using color. So I'll use some cool colors and I'll use some warm colors. Warm colors most likely will go in the areas that are in the shadows and cool colors will go more than likely in the areas that have the light. Even though the lights will have some warmth and cool colors and the shadows will have some warmth and cool colors. It's just a matter of seeing the difference between the two and striving to express them in the painting. Like I, I'm not going to have a cold color that will be in the shadows colder than the lights that are cool. I want to make sure that there's harmony in the light side versus the shadow side. But the value when it's darker, I will shift it into a cooler value in the shadows, um, but not as cold or cool as the light shapes because I, I really need to express and turn that form. And color makes a big difference on being able to do that. You can turn form without using color. You better believe your britches you can, but does it make it as interesting? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it does. I mean, look at how vibrant of a purple and blue I'm putting on that branch. The branch is gray. It's a gray branch, but I'm taking some artistic liberties and adding some high chroma colors in there to increase the interest. And over time, you'll see here in a little bit how I change it when I put in the background. But overall, I'm trying to get a sense of unity and color harmony between all of the objects. And if something is gray and it's in a cool light, it's going to go more blue. If it's gray and it's in a warm light, it's going to go more orange. So I'm trying to play with the the color and, and value differences between the two. Again, very important to be able to hold that paintbrush at a angle that is more parallel with the painting so that you can drag the texture or drag the color across and it'll create an interesting texture. If you hold it perpendicular to the paint, the painting surface, then um, you, you'll make a more deliberate mark it won't be accidental. It won't be, um, in my opinion, more interesting. I like to use the material at its strengths, and its strengths are, I think, texture for oil painting. And that's what this is, is a little oil painting of a still life. The other nice thing about painting a still life, in my opinion, is you're doing it from life. So I can sit there for hours and just look at the still life and try to figure out how do I paint this effectively or effective enough to convince people that it's a solid still life, that I was painting it from life. If I had a photographic reference for this, I, I just don't know if it would look that good. But okay, here I am zooming in on this nectarine there was some setting in. Setting in is where the color dries and it kind of goes slightly matte. I'm taking a little bit of oil and I'm painting it into this painting of a nectarine. And um, you can see that the values got darker and it got a little bit more glossy. That's because that oil layer is setting in. Now, what I would usually do, and I'm, I, I will do it right here because um, when I'm doing my second layer, you have to make sure that it's totally dry when you're painting onto it. But you get a paper towel after you've rubbed on some oil and you rub the paper towel over the 
surface that you just painted with oil. This removes the majority of the oil so that you can paint into it and it'll be a little bit more of a fat color over the initial layer. So this is all real time on what I'm doing and now I'm gonna speed it up again so that you can see the color changes. But here you can see I'm holding it at a angle so that I'm enhancing, enhancing the texture and I'm going slightly darker in value. I wanna push the value just a little bit darker. I can keep the chroma higher if I go darker instead of going so light. Um, here in the red, I used a perylene red on the initial red and this uh, lighter red is more of a cobalt red. Using the paintbrush on the side of it and I'm dragging it across to kind of express those different marks. I'm not going to cover up the whole entire painting because I want parts of that first layer of the nectarine to show through. I think that shows a lot more variation and interest for me in a painting. And um, it shows history. If I paint over the whole entire thing in one layer, it's like, well, I'm doing all a prima over an all a prima layer. So what's the point of doing that? And an effective way to paint over it, I think, is dragging the brush across the surface, kind of like how I'm doing right now, where you're holding it almost parallel with it and you're dragging it across and kind of moving some of that paint around. Um, now I'm starting to milk the mouse. That's why I call taking this little paintbrush and putting in some details, milking the mouse, because it's just small little changes in value and hue and chroma. I noticed also on the nectarine, the backside of it had this beautiful purple tone because it's that light that is bouncing off the back. It's, it's not direct, it's indirect, and the light is just coming across the back of it and makes it so beautiful. So you gotta cool that value down. Now, this pluot, on the other hand, as I was working on it, I noticed that the colors were not quite dark enough and they didn't vary as much as I wanted. It wasn't so um, purpley. It had, it had some more, purpley is a very technical word. It had some more uh, grays in it and more oranges, especially on the seed. And to describe the information on that seed, um, I looked at the negative shapes and just painted in those negative shapes that describe the seed shape. Um, I also noticed in the green of the pluot, you know, it was my first layer, it was not my finished layer, but I'm doing the same thing on this pluot as I did with the nectarine where I'm dragging the paintbrush across. I'm making some corrections in the size of the pluot. It looked a little bit too shallow for my liking. So I started to paint it a little bit bigger. But while I was painting it a little bit bigger, I was like, mm, that looks a little awkward. It just looked slightly weird. So I'm going to make changes to that again. But here I'm just placing, dry brushing the colors on top of the pluot and putting in some of that variation. More of a yellow green. And um, then it goes more into a neutral green. And then the reflected light is slightly more of a blue green. And uh, the values are very close together, but the color is what's really gonna make it turn. So use that color to turn form. Here I'm trying to get that highlight again, and that specular highlight needs to be enhanced just a little bit more because it's a glossy surface, especially on the edges. Uh, people use a very small brush to do this stuff. I like to use a bigger brush. I can hold more paint on it. And what if I mess up? Ah, it doesn't matter. You can just paint over it. Let it dry and paint over it. It's totally fine. It, it's never killed any painting. Now, I, I think the highlight's a little bit too much on the lip of that pluot where the seed is. And um, that's okay. I, I'll remove some of that so that the highlight is not so specular. And I felt like the seed was just too monochromatic. And here I go. I need to enlarge that pluot edge because it's just too narrow. I need to fit the other side of the pluot that was cut. And that color change of the green more of that neutral green, less yellow, less blue, and then more bluish of a green in the reflected light on the backside. If it's glossy, it's gonna reflect that environment. Here I go on the second pluot, 
and it was too small. Uh, according to my still life that I had sitting right there on day two. Um, and just to inform you, it took a couple of days for the first layer to dry. I paint with lead white, which makes the, for me, it, it makes it dry a lot faster, the paint film. If I use uh, titanium white, it would take a couple weeks. Even with quick dry white, it would take maybe a week for it to fully cure, but with lead white, the lead white that I make, it dries really quick, almost like a, a not acrylic quite, but it really cuts the time in half. So here I am painting the second pluot with it dry. The still lifes are s starting to change slight color because it's day two, and um, but once you paint these still life objects, a lot of times you begin to understand what the colors actually are and what they look like. And you don't actually need to use them as a reference anymore, especially if you've painted them for a long time. So here I'm just trying to express the color changes of the reds and oranges that are in the skin of the pluot along with the greens and also the specular highlight. But I think that's a pretty good view of what's going on with the shape. But you see the reflected light bouncing off of the bottom into the object and also from the top of the object because the light's bouncing off the wall that's behind it down into the pluot. And man, I used a palette knife to kind of cut that shape in a little bit more. There you go. So that the background comes in and it softens out the edge. That highlight needed to go a little bit more blue. It was too neutral. It needed to have more of a cool tone in it. So now on the second day of the grapes, I was like, oh, it's too dark. I need to lighten up the values and make it just a little bit more blue and some parts a little less blue, more of a gray. So I started to render out some of these forms, mostly in the lights, so that I could get that feel uh, that the grapes are giving in relation to the light. Now, some of the grapes had more of a greenish tone to them because they were not as ripe as the rest of the cluster. And I wanted to express that variation. I think it makes it look more natural compared to making everything the same exact color. I mean, who really wants to look at something that's the same exact color of the whole entire thing? I don't. So I'm doing these nice little still life paintings of these various objects, and it kind of looks separated, which again is totally fine. Adding more green to the grapes, and I'm trying to keep the value slightly darker, and also some more violets in those shadow values, and some more reds in the darker values. Now you can see that I didn't paint all of the grapes. I left some of those grapes in the darker value set, more abstract. Here I'm starting to put in the highlight on the grapes, but that's just to help me, help inform me, is it light enough? Is it dark enough? It, do I need to lighten it more? Do I need to turn the form more? Do I need to soften the edges? And if I don't paint those in there, I'll never be able to see it. Um, the other weird thing about this is the light is, it's like auto exposing. So it looks like it's getting lighter and darker when I'm painting. But here I'm back into normal speed, that pluot off to the right hand side. It was too dark in value. So I want to lighten it up and I just am placing a glaze. This is after the painting is dry from the second layer. And I'm just glazing on a milky value that will create a sense of atmosphere and kind of push it back behind that stick because it creates a, in my opinion, a weird looking effect next to the stick. So this is all real time with my glazing over that. Glazing is great. You can use it to push things back. You can use it to enhance colors or values. Um, you can make things more subtle with glazing. And even when you glaze and remove some of the glaze, it's, I think it's a great looking feature for it. But All right, so now I'm going back to the surface. The whole painting has been dry. This is the third layer. 
some of those grapes, I'm rendering out the info just a little bit more, turning the forms, darkening up some of those core values to make it look more reflective and semi-transparent in some of the grapes. I put purple down around the surface of the grapes because the grapes are reflecting a purple light in its environment. And I put something a little bit more purple than red underneath the nectarine. Um, but now it's just painting in that background. Some people say you should paint in the background first before you paint in your still life, which can be a good thing. I don't really care so much. I'm, I'm fine with painting around shapes instead of on shapes. There were a lot of Sargent paintings that I looked at when I was in Boston, and um, I noticed that Sargent would draw in some of his shapes. He would paint them in, and then he would paint the background around them. And it created a very interesting look. And uh, I, I want to incorporate that look into my paintings instead of painting the whole background and then painting the foreground and not having variation in paint quality or edge quality um, or shapes. And when I paint the background, I try to do it in one sitting. Sometimes if I mess up, I'm like, uh, I don't know, maybe should I scrape it off and start over? But I usually don't. I usually let it sit and cure, and then I'll do another layer on top of it to really kind of soften out edges. I try to keep my shadow shapes transparent and or thin. I think that it creates more interest. And then the light shapes, I try to thicken up a little bit more by adding more white, lead white, because it's freaking awesome, and softening out edge quality between shapes and hardening edges with using the background. I'll use the brush to harden out those edges a little bit more, and then I'll get back into the palette knife to add more paint, and also uh, in the more open spaces, just make the paint quality more interesting. And here you can see I took the paintbrush and I softened out the edges between the lights and the shadows being cast from the pluots. So I, I know that this is a really long video and I wanted to show a time lapse and have a discussion about why, why on earth I do still life paintings. And it's mostly because you can paint them from life. They're pretty inexpensive. The other thing, I have a whole entire orchard of almost 100 fruit trees in my backyard that I love caring for. And um, I want to express that. I will be doing a lot more paintings, a lot more still life paintings in the future because of all the fruit trees that I have. Um, but they, they tend to be a lot cheaper than models. I've spent a lot of money on having models sitting there and painting them from life. So I get a lot of experience when I paint from life with a still life. I would recommend using live uh, still life objects instead of taking a picture of a still life and painting it because pictures will change or alter the colors. They'll also change or alter the values and um, sometimes even the hue if you don't have your camera set up correctly. And people just feel like, oh no, I'm gonna take a picture because it'll capture everything exactly right. And it's not true. I've, I've shown lots of people with their, their phones or their cameras. Um, we've printed it out, we've looked on the screen, and I show them and compare the values and the color differences between taking a reference or painting it from life. So I always highly recommend painting from life. You're gonna learn a lot more by painting from life than you would by painting from a photographic reference. Um, especially if you're looking. If you're really looking at things, you'll see it. I also recommend going out into the world and looking at artwork, actual artwork of artists that you like. So go to museums, go to galleries, look at the artwork. How did they use a paintbrush? How did they use a palette knife? I didn't realize that, that Thayer used so much paint in his paintings. Dude, that one of my favorite paintings is of the angel. I think it's his daughter. And I just sat there and looked at the painting for four hours. 
I highly recommend getting out of the studio, getting out of or out of being in front of a screen or looking at people doing this, for example, and just getting out there and looking at what's available. You'll learn a lot more by looking at actual paintings than you would by looking at them digitally. We live in such a interesting time where you can see everything instantly, but doing it from life, the experience is totally different. So you can see here, I've painted in the background and I have thrown in lots of different colors, some violets, some yellows, some blues. I'm trying to make the background a little bit more interesting, but I'm darkening the values so that the gradient, it creates a gradient from the background to the foreground. The foreground's gonna be slightly more warm and the background's gonna be slightly more cool. Here I'm using the palette knife to kind of scrape away those shapes that I initially painted in that I covered up with the background color. And I will come back in and paint those slightly different. But the overall texture and feel of the wood, the grapes, I'm pretty much done with most of the stuff here. I just have a couple more minutes of painting in those backgrounds. Now, I had two choices. I could have let the background dry and come back in and paint it into it, or I would do what I am doing right now, which is painting into the wet background. If you paint into a wet background like I am right now, you have to make sure that you clean your brush after you do a couple of strokes. So you do one stroke, clean your brush, get more paint, do another stroke, clean your brush, get some more paint. You have to do that because the paint is going to mix with the background color that you have in there. And if you noticed, I took a palette knife and I kind of scraped away the paint of where I was going to put in the branches. That just means that there's less paint for me, my brush to pick up and I can be more direct with how I'm applying the paint into the background. It also creates more variation, I think. I really like scraping with the palette knife onto the surface so that I can uh, create more variation of marks in it. I saw a bunch of Rem Rembrandt paintings that had a similar feature and I was like, ah, I wanna try that out. So I do that in some of my paintings and give it that scratchy surface. But here I go, I'm signing the painting in the top right hand corner and that's basically it. So here I give you a close up view of the texture you can see the color changes that I used in the palette knife. Look at the blues and greens and the branches and the nectarine and the grapes. Not everything is rendered out. I, I know this is not the best quality. I mean, I'm just panning around with my camera trying to make it look interesting without spending thousands of dollars with an effective tool that would help pan the video. But um, you can see that there are some thicker parts, some thinner parts. There's the pluot in the background versus the foreground. I wanted to push that back a little bit more, but the interesting texture in the wood and the branches. And zooming out here, you can see the color change, not quite value, but the color change in the bottom right-hand corner of the blue versus the yellowish green. So two things I hope that you get from this video. Just start painting, that's number one. Get something down on your canvas, get out of your head and get to work. And number two, Get out there and really look at artwork and see how other artists have figured out how to problem solve and incorporate it into your own artwork. Thank you for watching and have an excellent day.